He could go all the way. Football is a huge part of American culture. Today, the NFL is a $9 billion industry. The players are treated and paid like gods. Cities grind to a halt on Super Bowl Sunday. Helmet safety is at its all-time high. Fans become upset. Touchdown! Touchdown! That is what happens when everything is balanced, but it wasn't always like this. The players were used and thrown away. Owners couldn't make a real profit and couldn't pay or protect their players. Without player and owner rights and responsibilities, we wouldn't have the football we know today. When the NFL first started in 1920, teams were unorganized with debt. The players had poor talent and the attendance rates of spectators were low. Players were paid on a per game basis or not at all. When the league expanded, players were provided with little or no benefits and had no rights. One example of this is Roy Zimmerman of the Redskins, who refused to play an exhibition game without pay and then got traded to the Eagles. Also, the NFL made a rule that banned a player for five years if they attempted to switch to the AAFC League. Bill Radovich was a player who jumped leagues for a bigger salary. After the, he played in the AAFC, he was blacklisted and was unable to find another job. The players grew tired of incidents such as these, and in 1956, a player union called the NFLPA, National Football League Players Association, was formed. One of the most important battles that the NFLPA won was led by their president, John Mackey, in 1972. The problem was the Roselle Rule's impact on free agency and trading. The Roselle Rule said that if teams could not agree on compensation of a player that wanted to move from one team to another, then the commissioner, Pete Roselle, could raid team funds and settle it himself. This was bad for the players because the owners would be hesitant to trade them. John Mackey filed the lawsuit, John Mackey vs. the NFL, and won, overruling the Roselle rule under antitrust laws. Owner responsibilities are not only to pay the players fairly, but it is also to look out for player safety. For example, the helmet has evolved many times over the years. In the 1920s, you didn't even see a helmet on a player because they would be called sissies. They were made out of leather and were mostly used as ear protectors. In 1939, a plastic helmet with a single bar across the face was invented and made mandatory. From the 1960s to now, the helmet has improved its ability to absorb impact, providing extra protection from concussions. But with this extra protection comes a new responsibility for the players. The biggest thing, though, is you want to take the helmet uh, out of the game. You know, I think. Over the last probably 10 to 15 years, the game's evolved in a way where the helmet is being used as a weapon now. It's not just the <clears throat> players that are getting hit by the helmets, but the, those that are leading with their helmets and leading with their heads are hurting themselves. The players and owners also have the responsibility to make sure that the play on the field is safe for everyone. The owners are responsible for drafting the penalties, and the players are responsible for not doing these penalties. Some of the penalties that are the most dangerous are the crackback block, the horse collar tackle, clipping, and spearing of the helmet. The TV makes these penalties more apparent and the owners can make a new penalty after watching dangerous tackles where too many players are getting hurt. The TV gives a mass majority of the NFL's money, contributing approximately $7 billion a year from network deals. Since the invention of the television, no sport has been better suited to the TV. However, dependency on the TV creates weaknesses and risks to the owner's right to make profits. In some ways, uh, one of the biggest challenges that we face is the quality of experience that the fans have at home watching TV is so good that we're concerned that people may look at it and say, you know, I don't really, should I pay a hundred bucks to go see the Packer game in person when I can sit in my living room and, you know, so. I think on, on the whole it's been good. I think we have to be a little careful though to make sure um, you know, that TV doesn't, because they pay us so much money, that they aren't controlling everything. One of the downsides of television and social media is that once a player does something criminal, it will be all over the news. Yet another player arrested. In 2007, the NFL commissioner created the off-field conduct policy. It prohibits players from committing crimes and encourages players to be role models and act responsibly or be suspended. This doesn't just hurt the league's image. Because the careers are so short. I mean, the average NFL career is like three years. So, you know, if, if they're you know, getting into trouble off the, the field, 
you know, that doesn't bode well for, you know, when their careers end. To make sure the NFL doesn't go too far, the NFLPA represents and protects the rights of players and can take action when they think that player discipline is too harsh. This organization also fights as a group of players, usually through the collective bargaining process, to negotiate with the owners for more rights, such as increase in salary, benefits, and player safety. In 2011, the NFLPA filed an antitrust lawsuit against the NFL. In response, the owners locked the players out, putting the season in jeopardy. Eventually, after five months of negotiations, on July 2011, they accepted a 10-year deal. Each side could claim a couple victories. The revenue split went 53-47 in favor of the owners and created a $120 million salary cap. However, in order for the owners to get these rights, they took out the 18-game season that the players despised and took out the twice-a-day training camps, often in 90-degree heat, and limited full contact practices. The players also got a salary boost when injured and they limited rookie salaries. The 2011 season was saved and rebalanced the rights and responsibilities of both players and owners. We fought our ground and we worked you know, with the owners to get a deal that we feel was fair for everybody. The NFLPA isn't the only group that keeps the owners in check. In 2013, 4,500 retired players and their families sued the NFL for misleading them over the long-term dangers of head injuries. Former players were suffering from diseases that they felt were caused by numerous concussions. For many years, the risk of suffering head injuries on the field was a hazard that was acceptable. Concussions were often called dings and not taken seriously. Over the years, more and more research shows that the link between concussions and chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, where the victim has memory loss, depression, and dementia. Judge Anita Brody heard the arguments from both sides and encouraged them to negotiate. They reached an initial agreement to fund $765 million in payout to players with CTE symptoms, medical exams, research, and education. Players are struggling and having a lot of problems. They don't have to prove that it's related to having played in the NFL. So if they have cognitive problems, you know, they have dementia, they have any issue at all related to cognitive impairment, uh, they can, they're eligible for money. As you can see, the NFL has been balancing the rights and responsibilities of players and owners since its founding. These negotiations go back and forth with both players and owners winning some and losing some. There have been and will be many changes to suit the need of both players and owners. Will social media outdate the TV, threatening the owners' rights to profit? Perhaps the future holds new rules to protect players and preserve their safety rights. Will they remove the face mask to keep the helmet from being used as a weapon? Will players accept the responsibility of being a role model and act responsibly? Will there be more links from brain disease to concussions, causing parents not to allow their children to play football, as current data sh already shows? What we do know is that as long as the rights and responsibilities of players and owners are balanced, then we will continue to have the most popular sport in our American culture.